Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. First headline, Gensler speaks on synthetic assets as the Fed discusses stable coins. In a conversation with the American Bar Association, Securities and Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler hinted that digital assets backed by traditional securities could fall under U.S. securities law. Gensler said, quote, it doesn't matter whether it's a stock token, a stable value token backed by securities, or any other virtual product that provides synthetic exposure to underlying securities. These platforms, whether in the decentralized or centralized finance space, are implicated by the securities laws and must work within our securities regime. His speech occurred just days after Binance announced the suspension of its stock token program, which had allowed customers to purchase tokenized versions of Tesla, Coinbase, MicroStrategy, Microsoft, and Apple. The SEC was not the only U.S. regulator looking into digital assets this week. Notably, the President's Working Group for Financial Markets, a presidential advisory group, met on Monday at the behest of U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to discuss, quote, the rapid growth of digital assets. According to a readout published after the meeting, the PWG expects to issue stablecoin-related recommendations in the coming months covering potential benefits, risks, and how stablecoins could fit into the U.S. regulatory framework. And speaking of stablecoins, next headline, Circle reveals reserves and Paxos snaps back. On Tuesday, Circle, the company behind USDC, the second largest stablecoin in circulation, released its latest reserve attestation, revealing how USDC is backed. Based on data from mid-July, 61% of USDC is backed by cash or cash equivalents. 13% is in the form of Yankee CDs, 12% sit in U.S. Treasuries, commercial paperbacks 9%, and 5% of the reserve's allocation is in corporate bonds. If those numbers are confusing, don't worry. Even Decrypt's Jeff Roberts needed clarification, asking on Twitter, Finance people, is it a big deal that Circle's USDC reserves are 14% non-cash equivalents? Someone told me these aren't liquid enough to withstand a run on the stablecoin, but I really don't know. Paxos gave an answer in a downright frothy blog post on Wednesday, which started with a shot across the bow at Circle. Dan Bernstein, general counsel and chief compliance officer at Paxos, wrote, quote, I have been reading with a combination of disbelief and exasperation, the recent claims by Circle that, quote, USDC has become the world's most trusted and regulated dollar digital currency. Neither USDC nor Tether is a regulated digital asset for the simple reason that neither token has a regulator. These tokens are backed by illiquid and risky debt obligations, a critical weakness that no prudential regulator would allow to exist as this creates undue risk for their customers. Bernstein contrasted USDC's 61% cash or cash equivalent reserves and USDT's 49.6% commercial paper reserves to that of PAX and BUSD, both of which are managed by Paxos, and which he described as regulated stablecoins tied directly to the value of the US dollar. PAX and BUSD are backed by 96% cash and cash equivalents. Before signing off, he added, Regulatory oversight is important because it assures stablecoin users that the dollars underlying their stablecoins are secure and will be immediately available when they want them. To round out a hectic week in stablecoins, Tether's general counsel went on CNBC's Tech Check and announced that an official audit of USDT, the largest stablecoin, could be months away. Tether has spoken of producing an audit since 2017. Next headline, New Jersey, Alabama, and Texas regulators warn BlockFi. On Monday evening, Reforbs reported the New Jersey Bureau of Securities ordered crypto lender BlockFi to stop accepting new BlockFi interest account clients in New Jersey. The report was later confirmed by BlockFi CEO Zach Prince. New Jersey contends that BlockFi interest accounts are a form of unregistered securities, while BlockFi believes that its BlockFi interest accounts are lawful and appropriate for crypto market participants. As of now, BlockFi has until July 29th to stop accepting new BlockFi interest account clients. In his tweet thread, Prince assured current clients and others that the order would not impact their experience. On Wednesday, the Alabama Security Commission, or ASC, joined New Jersey, claiming BlockFi has sold $14.7 billion worth of unregistered securities through its BlockFi interest account program. The ASC took a slightly different approach by issuing a show cause notice 
ordering BlockFi to explain why they should not be directed to cease and desist from selling unregistered securities in Alabama. BlockFi responded on Twitter saying, quote, we are aware of the show cause order issued by the Alabama Securities Commission. Our stance hasn't changed. The BlockFi interest account is not a security. And lastly, on Thursday, the Texas State Securities Board, or TSSB, filed for a cease and desist against BlockFi, according to Coindesk. For now, BlockFi is allowed to continue operations in the state, with a TSSB director noting, quote, This legal action affords BlockFi and its affiliates the opportunity to respond to our allegations and present admissible evidence. Next headline. FTX announces crypto's largest funding round ever. Cryptocurrency exchange FTX announced a $900 million funding round at an $18 billion valuation on Tuesday. Over 60 investors participated in, in the raise, including Sequoia, Paradigm, SoftBank, Third Point, Multicoin Capital, among others. According to the block, the raise represents the largest funding round in crypto history. Forbes reports that Binance, which had invested in FTX as part of a strategic play in 2019, has already given up its equity stake. The Sam Bankman fried led company has seen explosive growth since its May 2019 launch. FTX says the exchange revenue has increased tenfold year to date and 75 times since early 2020. The company now has over 1 million users and averages $10 billion in daily trading volume. The near billion dollar influx of cash will immediately be put to use, purchasing, quote, the fanciest beanbag available. OpenSea also announced a large funding round this week, bringing in $100 million at a $1.5 billion valuation through a Series B led by A16Z. OpenSea plans to launch cross-blockchain support, starting with a partnership with Polygon that includes a gas-free marketplace. In related news, cryptocurrency miner Course Scientific is merging with Power and Digital Infrastructure Acquisition Corp., a SPAC, and will trade on NASDAQ. The deal values the company at $4.3 billion, nearly two times larger than rival Bitcoin miners Riot Blockchain and Marathon Digital's market cap. Core minted more than 3,000 Bitcoin in 2021, while Riot and Marathon combined have generated only 2,000 BTC. Next headline. Axie Infinity revenue nearly matches Ethereum's. According to data from Token Terminal, Axie Infinity generated nearly equivalent revenue to Ethereum over the past seven days, more than doubling any other protocol, dApp, or blockchain in crypto. Ethereum still led the week with $32.8 million in revenue, though Axie Infinity came in a close second place, bringing in $31.7 million. The following three participants, Uniswap, PancakeSwap, and Aave, combined total just around $27 million in revenue during the same period. According to Coindesk's Leah Callen Butler, Axie Infinity's revenue growth is just the tip of the iceberg. Butler reports that Axie Infinity is creating real world wealth, especially in the Philippines. She notes that out of Axie Infinity's nearly 500,000 daily active users, over 60% come from the Philippines. Indeed, Butler estimates that Axie player revenue amongst Filipinos could reach over $10 billion annually. Next headline. A class action lawsuit claims Definity's ICP was sold as an unregistered security. California resident Daniel Ocampo has filed a class action lawsuit against Definity, claiming that the company sold its Internet Computer Project, or ICP, tokens as an unregistered security. The complaint was filed, quote, on behalf of all investors who purchased Internet Project tokens on or after May 10, 2021. The lawsuit alleges that over 400 million ICP tokens were sold in violation of the 1933 Securities Act. In addition to coming after Definity's founder, Dominic Williams, the suit also targets Polychain Capital and A16Z, both early backers of the project. ICP has faced scrutiny ever since its genesis launch in May due to extremely volatile price action and whispers of insider trading. Time for fun bits! Imagine explaining Ethereum with Vitalik listening. Actor and investor Ashton Kutcher posted a hilarious video explaining the basics of Ethereum featuring himself, Mila Kunis, his wife, and Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin. In the first part of the video, Kutcher asks Kunis easy questions like, what's crypto? Or what's blockchain? To which Kunis responds with succinct answers. About halfway through, Kutcher asks for a description of Ethereum before turning the camera past Kunis to show a kitchen table where Vitalik Buterin gives a one-minute spiel on its fundamentals. The video was created to promote Kutcher's 
Stoner Cats NFT collection, which consumers must hold to access the Stoner Cats NFT animated series. Second fun bits. Twitter throws shade at Ethereum. For a while now, tweeting hashtag Bitcoin or hashtag BTC would enable a little Bitcoin symbol to pop up just after it. Well, now, hashtag ETH comes with its own emoji as well, but in a massive troll of Ethereum, it's the flag for Ethiopia. All right, well, thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Neha and the Digital Currency Initiative, be sure to check out the links in the show notes. Heads up, everyone. The Unchained newsletter has switched from a weekly news recap to a daily email. Each morning, you'll get four to five quick headlines, a crypto meme or two, and a few recommended reads. Head to unchainedpodcast.com and the sign up for the newsletter is right on the homepage. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Mark Murdoch, and Daniel Ness. Thanks for listening.